Greetings ladies and gentlemen, this is the Inept General and welcome to our Legendary Lord Law video on Ikit Claw. Ikit Claw most likely going to turn out to be one of Clan Scryer's representatives in the Total War Warhammer campaign as of this recording, not yet out, but I do imagine we'll see him soon as there are a number of Clan Scryer units missing that I'm sure will be filled in later in development for Total War Warhammer 2. But without further ado, let's uh, kick things off and go on with the story of Ikit Claw. So Ikit Claw is thought to have been born sometime before the year 1850 of the Imperial Calendar. That puts about 650 years before the current Total War Warhammer timeline. Ikit grew into a tall Skaven who was white furred and had an affinity for magic when he sort of grew into full adulthood. One imagines that he used these gifts to gain some form of high recognition with the master of his clan, as he had a huge thirst for magical knowledge, and at some point was either allowed to or decided by himself to go and scour the world for magic, and it would be quite hard for a lone Skaven to do this, so we have to imagine he had the permission of the lord of his clan, Lord Warlock Morskitter, and so was allowed to pursue Sue his first for magical knowledge and bring it back to Clan Scryer. He's said to have traveled all over the Warhammer world, studying under the cruel forge masters of the Chaos Dwarves, going off and learning the secrets of magic in Cathy, risking the ire of Clan Pestilens by venturing into Lustria and learning how the ancient machines in that jungle worked, and he even got into the vaults of Vorgsgar in the northern part of Nagaroth. So he has been all around the Warhammer world, conducting all sorts of experiments, learning through all kinds of different masters. Eventually he returned to Clan Scryer and informed his lord of some of the things he'd learned and told him that the forges of Clan Scryer, who were kind of known as tinkerers within Skaven society, he informed them that they were all woefully inadequate and began a huge rebuild of the clan's forges in order to kick out a brand new generation of weaponry. Now, this also coincided with the fact that Igit Claw, now known as the right fang of his clan master, Morskitar, had foreseen some upcoming trouble in the whole of Skaven society, and so began to build up a vast armory of weapons from the new technology that Ikit Claw had brought back and that other tinkerers within the clan had managed to put together. It's thought to be around this time that Ikit Claw is given the credit for the creation of the Warp Lightning Cannon. Now, I've also seen it put in other places that he's been given credited for the Doom Wheel, but I was not able to pin down an official source for that one myself, but the Warp Lightning Cannon we've heard that he was responsible for inventing. And this leads us all into the year 1850. Now, around this time, trouble was brewing. Clan Pestilence had put together an idea of marching over Britonia and then all over the surface. The Skaven ultimate aim is to conquer the whole world for their race. And so what Clan Pestilence had done, much like Skaven had done previously, was let loose a disease and then they were going to march on the surface once most of the resistance had succumbed to said disease. Now in Britonia they thought it was working, they charged out onto the surface of Britonia, but eventually were fought back by a joint army of Britonians and Wood Elves. And this caused a scar people decided that clan pestilence sort of weren't worth it the trouble anymore and this caused a huge tear in Skaven society kicking off what would become known as the second Skaven civil war this was the trouble that Clan Scryer had seen coming, and Ikit Claw and his master were ready. In the Scryer quarter of the capital of Skaven Blight, they'd built up a huge arsenal of weaponry and began to firstly secure their quarter, and then Ikit Claw was assigned to secure the most important part of the capital for Skavendom, which is the Temple of the Horned Rat. Now, the Temple for the Horned Rat ties into the foundation myth of the Skaven, which was it's a massive tower built in the center of the city, where the first screaming bell, shall we call it, was installed by a mysterious stranger, leading to the birth of the Skaven race. So he secured this massive tower, the Temple of the Horned Rat, 
for Clan Scryer, and Clan Scryer then moved on with the enough army and forces they had to take over the whole of Skaven Blight. And in that moment, they attempted to quell trouble that could spread throughout the entire empire by saying, we rule Skaven Blight, that we now rule the whole of the Skaven Empire. However, it was too late. Fighting had started to spread amongst the other cities by the time they had full control over Skaven Blight. And so there was no keeping the Skaven Empire together. It was breaking apart, but they did have control of the capital as far as Ikit Claw and his master were concerned. Now that they had control of the capital, this is when Ikit Claw really started to get to work. He started to put all his knowledge to the test and then build on that. He started to carry out horrific experiments involving hundreds of Skaven slaves. He'd experiment on humans, dwarves, whatever he could get his hands on. He'd experiment on lich priests from the lands of the dead. He did all kinds of messed up things. Essentially, over this period of time, Ikit Claw is making Mengele look like Patch Adams. He he is just doing horrific things to any living thing he can get his hands on to experiment with. But he is expanding his knowledge, learning it from every experiment, and becoming increasingly more dangerous with all the knowledge he was gaining. However, hubris can be the fall of many great Skaven, and this is what happened to Ikit Claw. During one of his more volatile experiments, an explosion went off in his lab, burning him, sort of setting his fur on fire, burning his face horrifically, and magically kind of withering the whole left side of his body, leaving him a sort of crippled, burnt, and broken Skaven. However, it did not cost Ikit his life. And using the knowledge he'd gained from all of his horrific experiments, he started to use the thing he still had available to him, his twisted, warped, but one cannot argue, genius mind. And he started to control construct an exoskeleton for himself that could support his body and make him even more dangerous than he had been before. In so doing, he built kind of an ironwork frame covering him almost head to toe in armor. He built a huge claw gauntlet to take the place of his withered left arm and the whole frame starts to support his body run by a warp generator attached to his back, making it sort of a technological and magical combination that would both now strengthen his body and made him far more lethal. This construct was finished by about the year 2150. Now, it's worth noting at this stage that Skaven do not live very long. They have very short lifespans. So in his adventures and travels, Ikit Claw had picked up the secret that really only the Council of Thirteen had kind of had to themselves from this time, and that was the secret of effective immortality for a Skaven. He's already been alive longer than most Skaven live. So Ikit Claw is effectively immortal, short of someone just killing him, Age probably isn't going to catch up with him like it does other Skaven. He's figured out a way out of it. Exactly what this is, I don't think we're ever really told. We just have to assume some combination of science and magic, much like all warlock engineers dedicate themselves to. But Ikit Claw now being able to be the right-hand man for his clan master for now until the end of times, shall we say. So, it's the year 2150, by the time he finishes his exoskeleton, they're still in control of Skaven Blight, and so they go on, he continues his experiments, he continues to sort of work and improve on his exoskeleton, and this is just Ikit Claw's, like, time that he's inventing, he's working, he's busying away. And you know what, from what I know of Ikit Claw, probably a wonderfully happy time in his life as well. Now, by the year 2302, so another 150 years ahead of when he'd finished his exoskeleton, Ikit Claw and his master are called to the Great Summoning. Now, the Grey Seers had left Skaven Blight sometime after Clan Scry had taken it up, and they'd gone and set up base underneath Marienburg. But Ikit Claw and Clan Scry, they were all called to it along with the other sort of leaders of what was the Council of Thirteen, at least the ones that are representing at the moment. And by using the magic that was sort of coming up from a massive chaos invasion, the green moon of the Warhammer world, Morris Lab, was very close to the earth, meaning magic was in full force. The Grey Seers of Skavendom put their power together and summoned forth the god of all Skavendom, the Horned Rat himself. And the Horned Rat said, enough of this internal feuding. 
reforged the Council of Thirteen, and then Skaven them, the Empire of Skaven them can go on from there. So it's at this stage that really Skaven Blight is not fully under the control of Clan Scryer anymore after the Great Summoning. It goes back into control of the Council of Thirteen, but Clan Scryer still has its like territories here and there, but they're not directly necessarily in control of Skaven Blight. That's more of the entire council at this stage. So they go on from there, still having a lot of strength in Skaven Blight itself, however, because of just the nature and being in charge of the city for so many centuries, uh, they do have a strong holding in the capital. So Ikiklaw, ever thirsty for knowledge, continues his travels, goes around the old world a little bit more, trying to learn as much as he can, and eventually in sort of going through the whatever can be construed as libraries and Skavendom or histories, he discovered something known as the Doom Sphere. Now, the Doom Sphere, the first use of a Doom Sphere, or I don't know if it was quite called the Doom Sphere at the time, of just a magical device that was used by Skavendom, was in the year of the Imperial Calendar, negative 1500. So that was 1500 years before the arrival of Sigmar in the human calendar. So this is ancient, ancient history for the Skaven. And what had happened was uh, something had gone off, a magical device had gone off that triggered what became known as the Disaster of Skaven Blight. Now, after all the humans and the dwarves died out in the city that existed before the rats killed everything that was there and took it over as Skaven Blight, the Skaven all lived underneath the city, and they were looking for a way to break to the surface and take over the overworld. And so they invented this magical device that would allow them to do this en masse. However, the device went wrong somehow and ended up completely, like, shuddering the entire landscape around Skaven Blight, causing a huge tidal wave to come over, which ended up wrecking the city above it, which ended up flooding the entirety of the area around it, causing the area around Skaven Blight to become the Blighted Marshes. Now, this came along probably a little bit later in the lore as far as Games Workshop was writing it, but this was then attributed to a device known as the Doom Sphere, and Ikit Claw had got the plans and had figured out how to recreate this thing, and he thought, unlike the Skaven of old, he could actually get it to work. Now, unlike previously in Skaven Blight, they weren't looking to sort of erupt onto the surface of Skaven. For this time, Ikit Claw's idea was to use it to get rid of one of their worst enemies, the Dwarves, who had hampered them at every turn, and he thought if he'd set one of these off along the fault lines in the World's Edge Mountains, it would kill a lot of Skaven, for sure but it would absolutely decimate the dwarves to the point that they could never recover. Already kind of a race on decline, this could be their death blow, and that's what Ikit Claw was planning. So he set off to the Skaven cities or Skaven Warren underneath Karak Azul, and his idea was build one of these doom spheres and allow it to crack open the fault line, destroying most of the major dwarven cities and allowing Skaven to take over the entire mountain range. They would still have, probably have the green skins to fight with, but they were nothing probably as much of a trouble as the dwarves. So this was the idea and he set about building the Doom Sphere underneath Karakazul. Now, unluckily for him, his plans were discovered when a group of heroic dwarves fell upon the chamber he was building the Doom Sphere in and engaged him in combat. The leader of these dwarves was one he'd met before, who had a golden beard and who had kind of golden eyes. He looked quite unusual for a dwarf, and that's why Ikit Claw remembered him, because the two had met previously up in the northern area of Krakadrak, when Ikit Claw was trying to kidnap some dwarven engineers to torture them for their knowledge of machinery. However, he was intercepted by this blonde dwarf before, and now twice this one looked to be ruining his plans. So this dwarven party bursts into the main chamber where the Doom Sphere is. They start to hack down all the Skaven around it, coming straight for the Doom Sphere. Eventually, the dwarven leader manages to fight himself face to face with Ikit Claw. Ikit Claw raises his huge claw with a warp fire throw in it and unleashes warp fire on this dwarf, who manages just to narrowly avoid it. The dwarf, in turn, draws pistols and starts firing down at Ikit Claw, who uses the massive claw to hide his face, but really 
his armor just bounces off all the bullets and manages to deflect most of them, causing very little damage to Ikit Claw with his exoskeleton. Ikit Claw then conjured some warp lightning to fire at the dwarf, but the dwarf's armor seemed to absorb most of the shock, and he didn't have time to get the spell off at full potency, with the dwarf still charging down at him. The dwarf then struck Ikit Claw down with a single blow of his hammer, and then started to repeatedly bash down on Ikit Claw's claw, completely crumpling the machinery and destroying his primary weapon. Things looked dire for Ikit, he didn't know what to do, he was pinned, he had this manic dwarf crumpling his arm, and then uh, the Doom Sphere started to hiss and splutter and shriek, and green gas started to pour out of it, and those closest to the Doom Sphere sort of started to melt and scream and shudder and cough up blood as this poisonous gas started to pour into the chamber where the weapon had been constructed. Bits of the outer casing started to fly off, huge meter-long sheets of metal flying and embedding themselves into the sides of the cavern, taking dwarf and skaven alike with them if they were unlucky enough to be in the way. The whole thing looked about to explode prematurely, and that's when the dwarf on top of him, seeing the gas approach, left. Ikit knew he had some protection from this gas through the respiratory system he'd built into the metal mask he now wears to hide his burned and scarred face, and so set about trying to save the machine, seeing if he could get it to go off properly rather than malfunction in this way, and he set off at the controls, exchanging one last hateful glance to the blonde-haired, gold-eyed dwarf who was fleeing the chamber as the gas continued to leak out from the spluttering and shrieking doom sphere. Alas, Claw could not save the machine, and he managed to escape with his life. However, the machine did not go off at nearly its full potency, causing very little damage other than just leaking poisonous gas everywhere and kind of melting in on itself. It was a huge disappointment, but Claw was not going to give up. He saw what had gone wrong. It was the outer casing. It simply wasn't strong enough. And when that started to give way under the immense forces of the machine itself, the whole thing began to malfunction. What he needed was a stronger metal. And so he'd either have to find one or make one himself. And so Ikit has not given up on this dream of cracking open the fault line in the World's Edge Mountains and destroying all the dwarves therein. But he just needs to find the right materials. And so that's what he set about trying to do, scouring the world, using spies and information networks to hear of any materials, and again, probably spending some time trying to devote to making the material himself, but he'd had little luck so far. Many years later, Ikit's spies get back to him that there's a mysterious new metal alloy being used in the dwarven city of Karakankul. Now, exactly where Karakankul is, I don't think we're ever told in this tale. We have to just assume it's a Karak somewhere in the World's Edge Mountains. So he sends agents to steal samples of this metal, and he gets an idea that yes, this new alloy is good enough to work, to allow the Doom Sphere to actually function. And not only that, but he's also got word that Bone Stash, the city underneath Karakangul, run by Clan Moors, has requested aid from Clan Scryer for a couple of artillery pieces and some warlock engineers to try and help them take the Dwarven Karak. And he, in this moment, sensed opportunity. He could go to help Clan Moors bring an army of himself and finally allow the Doom Sphere to take shape, unleashing the weapon upon all of the World's Edge Mountains, finally allowing Skaven and perhaps even more wanting Clan Scryer to take over and uh, rule much of the hills of the World's Edge Mountains, eliminating the dwarves once and for all. However, before he's able to put any plan into shape, he's got wind that a smarmy warlock by the name of Kashkit Steelgrin has gotten ahead of him and is looking to loot the Karak for himself, putting together a party of his own to march to the aid of Bonestash and Clan Moors and try and just take all the loot, not knowing that a much larger game is potentially at play Claw sets off to try and deal with this upstart warlock engineer. 
In the tunnels between Skaven Blight and Bone Stash, Ikid Claw set up the ambush. He'd brought very strong forces, some new Skaven automatons who he'd fitted with something akin to his own exoskeleton, but who effectively had no minds of their own, who he could order about at will, could be very potent and scary warriors, much more disciplined than your typical Skaven or even your typical Storm Vermin. Along with these, he'd brought Poison Wind Glow Bedeers, warp fire throwers, mortars, all the weaponry and regalia that one might expect from a force of Clan Scryer troops. He'd gotten wind that the upstart Steelgrin was approaching and their ambush was about to take place. The Russell Together forces of Casket Steelgrin had come into view and Ikit signaled the ambush. The Jezail started to open fire with their sniper rifles picking off prime targets. Warp fire throwers unleashed their fire into the leading part of the party, hoping to just take out the leadership, for Ikit had planned to take over most of this party to help reinforce the troops traveling to Karakankul as it was. So, they set about burning off the front of the forces, and he got the reaction he desired predictably from the Skaven in the marching columns. Fear Musk's scent started to fill the air of the tunnels, and that is when he started to march forward himself, picking off any targets who dare get anywhere near Ikit Claw. That's when him and his leading vanguard were brought to a standstill by a huge rat ogre who emerged from behind a rock, about to start start attacking them, but then it froze in place. As Ikit Claw noticed, this rat ogre had obviously had some clan scryer augmentations put onto it, but they continued on, and then Ikit Claw spotted the traitor meat casket in the crown and sent a bolt of warp lightning straight at the warlock engineer. It managed to hit the warlock in the shoulder, detaching his weapon arm and sending it spinning across the tunnel floor. The warlock engineer then tried to run as Claw summoned forth another spell as a dark halo of magical energy emerged over the Skaven's head, at which point the halo began to shrink around the Skaven's head, casket steel grin's head exploded and left gore splattering the roof and walls of the tunnel. Their leader dared, Claw let himself let out a little chuckle that sounded like a knife grazing against stone as it echoed around the walls of the tunnel. He proceeded to address the standing column who were cowering in fear mostly at this stage. Ikit addressed the cowering crowd. Squeak swear to serve me or join full meat in death. Ikit could see in the faces of the Skaven in the tunnels that some wave of recognition was sweeping over their ranks, for Ikit Claw over his centuries of life had built up a fearsome reputation amongst the entire Skaven Empire, and recognizing his seniority and who he was, many of the Skaven were happy to acquiesce and to march under the banner of Ikit Claw. Suddenly, off to his right, a loud crack was heard, wood striking against stone. As he turned to spin, he saw a Gracia emerging from the rock where the Rat Ogre had come out from some time before. Now, for those of you who don't know, Gracias are the magic users of the Skaven Kingdom, so formidable. Good, good. Casket Sleek was traitor meat. You all act, sir, horn rat, when you kill slay traitor meat. I told my servantling, as the Gracia sort of gestured over to another Gracia further back in the column, to make sure Clan Scryer had time to take finish casket. Told Bone Ripper not to harm Claw. At that little bit of knowledge, that claim to fame that this Gracia had stopped this Bone Ripper Rat Ogre from doing any harm to Claw, started to allow that same chuckling laughter that sounded like a knife on stone grating across its surface to burst from his lips again as the Gracia continued to insist that he'd saved Claw's life by stopping the Rat Ogre. The rest of Clan Scryer started to erupt in laughter as a cacophony of laughter echoed around the tunnels. Claw then proceeded to explain to this Gracia who he'd actually heard of and turned out to be a Gracia of some, let's say, ill repute. 
known as Fanquall, that because of the augmentations Clan Scryer had put on this rat ogre, it was unable to hurt any Skaven that smelt of Clan Scryer, and he knew that this was now a boisterous, foolish Gracier. Although perhaps he could still have some use for him, and he allowed Fanquall, the other Gracier, and the rest of the Skaven in the marching column to join his forces as they marched to Bonestash to try and help take over the Dwarven Karak. At least that was the official reason. On the journey to Bonestash, Ikit Claw had noticed the Grey Seer Fanquil kind of poking around, and with him carting pieces of the Doom Sphere, he couldn't allow the Grey Seer to know his true intentions. So he kept a very close eye on Fanquil, and when he noticed Fanquil's Rat Ogre, causing a ruckus up near the front of the column. He knew that this had to be some form of distraction, and went back in the column to where the pieces of his Doom Sphere were being carted, only to find Fanquil almost taking the covers off one of the carts, promptly stopping him and threatening Fanquil by saying he'd simply bite his nose off if he saw him going near any of those parts again. Fanquil kind of cowardly backed off and wandered off, but he knew the Gracier, knew there was more to Claw's plan than perhaps simply going and helping the dwarves. He would have to keep a very close eye on that annoying Gracier. Eventually, they finally arrived at Bonestash underneath the dwarven city of Karakankul, and they had to make contact with the troops who were there, the troops that belonged to Clan Moors. Now, Ikit Claw, not wanting to risk his own life in this first exchange, because initially they might not be expecting Claw, and might be expecting the full traitor meat he'd just blown the head off in the fact of Steelgrin. So he sends Fanquil on ahead, and there's some commotion in the tunnel. He can see a sort of warp lightning being cast down there, and Fanquil's bone ripper causing some ruckus. But eventually it seems that Fanquil makes contact with Clan Moors, and they join forces to proceed to march on the Dwarven City, although that, of course, not being Claw's true aim. Now, Bonestash itself was maybe kind of an atypical uh, Skaven Warren. There were hundreds of miles of winding tunnels with no rhyme or reason to the layout. Caverns were carved out in seemingly random areas. Unless you knew it, it'd be very simple to get lost in if you relied on sight, but luckily the Skaven simply relied on smell for most of the time they were in their tunnels, and so that that's how they got about. They also had some agricultural stuff going on. Not that they harvest much, but they did make some kind of weird bread out of fungus that would grow on their pellets, on their feces, effectively, that they would eat. They also used kind of goblin slaves to marshal around beetles that they'd sometimes eat as well. And you know what? If it came down to it, they'd sometimes just straight up eat the gobbo slaves while they were at it too. Now, they also had some 30 or so brood mothers here who were giving birth to litters kind of round the clock as much as they could. So, you know, not a half bad, decent Skaven Warren, but not exactly a metropolis either. Now, the leader of Clan Moors of this city, the one who'd been established, was a Skaven by the name of Ricket Snapfang. Now, Ricket Snapfang was not the most authoritative Skaven in the world, and Ikit Claw didn't have any trouble kind of taking over his chambers, moving him out of his rooms, and kind of just really having the running of bone stash to himself he'd set in motion ways to start stealing the metal beams from the dwarven city without them noticing he had spies infiltrating the city just trying to steal beams when no dwarves were looking and this seemed to be working he'd just have to buy his time in bone stash to finish the construction of the doom sphere to this aim he sort of confiscated hundreds of skaven slaves to put them to work constructing his machine now he knew if clan moors kind of got wind of exactly what he was doing there'd been some kind of backlash so what he did was he had to play up to appearances and he convened a war council with ricket snap fang and uh, eventually they summoned fangquall into the room as well now they asked ricket to explain what the kind of resistance was from the 
dwarves, and the dwarves seem to have developed some kind of automated artillery that had just been devastating the troops of Clan Moors, and they couldn't find a way around it, thus the request for artillery and warp lock engineers to try and shut down this artillery, um, as well as just the normal dwarven artillery that would be brought down, holding them at bay. Now, in a bid to perhaps, you know, just buy time and get rid of a fawn in his side in the shape of Fanquil, the Gracier, they decided to send out a scouting party. Ikit Claude promised his best warp lock Gisales, uh, so the snipers of his army, and Clan Moors promised some of their best troops to help in this scouting effort already, so they could get an exact idea of exactly the type of resistance they might be facing. Really kind of a suicide mission to try and get Fanquil out the way, but at this point, Ikit Claude is just trying to buy time to pull off his plan without the other Skaven finding out about it and without the Dwarves finding out about it. So both it would be a distraction for the Skaven and the Dwarves, this little scouting party. Fanquil not really having any troops of his own, it's kind of just sent out there, kind of left out to dry, doesn't really have much choice in the matter, and it turns out the best troops of Clan Moors, not really the best troops at all, kind of a flea-bitten, raggedy bunch that was sent out there. With Fanquil out the way, with Clan Moors kind of satiated for now in terms of their army plans, Ikit Claw gets around to the hard work of building the Doom Sphere. The slaves are put to work, he's taking timber from Bone Stash, he's using their supplies, their materials, and he starts to set up the Doom Sphere in the largest chamber in Bone Stash, and it begins to take shape. Also, knowing his plan and not wanting much resistance to what he was doing, Ikit Claw, also not maybe being completely heartless and wanting to maybe save some Skaven lives, decides to order the evacuation of of Bone Stash. Now, he offered no reason for this, didn't tell anyone what was going on, didn't tell Rickett, the leader of Clan Moors, what was going on. He's just like, get out of here, everybody run who's not necessary. Now, he knew this was called Vast Panic. Most Skaven would assume this meant that the dwarves were coming to Bone Stash and Ikit Claw was just trying to get them all out of there. And this kind of kicked off the dog eat dog or rat eat rat behavior of the Skaven as they started to squabble over the supplies, as they all started to run wanting to take something for themselves if they were going to abandon this warren. Now, Rickett was just incensed by this. He's like, what are you doing? Everyone's running. It's a panic. Like, the brood mothers are being moved. Like, what's going on? You're just causing chaos. To which mostly Kit Claw just sort of left him to it. Now, he'd been posting storm vermin in vital areas that he needed to help with the construction. But as for the rest of Bone Stash, the Skaven city, it just descended into chaos as Kit Claw began to build up the Doom Sphere. Now, as the Doom Sphere began to take shape, they got the sort of main power base, the furnace of the Doom Sphere going. He had slaves shoveling warp stone into it to begin to power the machinery of the thing to kind of build up the energy levels. When out of nowhere, much to his surprise and chagrin, did Ikit Claw see that Fanquil had returned from his scouting mission. Now, when Fanquil walked into the main chamber where the Doom Sphere was going on, at this point, Claw felt there was nothing much that could stop him doing his plan. So Fanquil might be upset, but he didn't really have much at his back, and though Ricket Snapfang from Clan Moors was whispering in Fanquil's ear, obviously asking him for help to stop whatever Claw was doing, Claw kind of just took it in his stride. And when questioned by Fanquil, simply said, to create, one must must destroy. To destroy, one must must create. This will will be greatest invention. Make force all Skaven bow, grovel, and destroy all enemies. Fanquil, not really understanding what he was looking at, simply replied, This is madness. To which Claw looked at him dead on in the eye and said, No. This is the Doom Sphere. Now, Fanquil, a kind of look of recognition went over Fanquil's eyes as Claw kind of thought that he knew what a Doom Sphere was. He'd heard the stories, at least, of the disaster at Skaven Blight and knew the kind of power the Doom Sphere could bring. Now, suddenly, Fanquil became very cooperative. Ikit Claw could only surmise that at some point this sneaking Gracia was hoping to take over the Doom Sphere in order to seize power within the Skaven Empire for himself, but he was okay to allow Fanquil to think this was even a possibility, and okay to allow Fanquil to think that they weren't going to set off the Doom Sphere and that they were just building one, you know, to have to uh, blackmail their allies and to scare their enemies. You know, more of a threat of violence than actually using it, whereas Ikit Claw had full intention of blowing this thing up, but a detail he did not have to tell the Gracia Fanquil at this stage. 
So Thankwall, having this change of tone, sensing an opportunity for himself, begins to cooperate and offers all the help he can get. He says, look, as a Grey Seer, I'm effectively a priest of the Horned One. Let me calm the masses who are panicked outside and stealing and robbing from each other and get many more to help you. And uh, what else do you need from me? Is there anything else I can do to help? Now, Claw, being appreciative of the extra help that these kind of souls who are scurrying around could actually lend to the construction of the Doom Sphere, and having just got word before the arrival of Fanquil that the dwarves had started to replace all of their special metal beams with just the old ones that they'd had there before, meant that his supply of the metal had been cut off. Now, he knew from his spies and through sneaking around the city above that the dwarves had put all of the metal into the smelting holes. Claw knew how to get there. In order to sneak into that room to get the rest of the metal that he'd need to finish the Doom Sphere, he'd need a distraction. So after Fanquil managed to kind of calm the masses outside, he asked Fanquil to put together an army to march on the Dwarven city and to get the metal for him. Now, Claw had no plans of relying on Fanquil to get the metal. In fact, this was yet another ruse to allow Fanquil to lead troops away, get killed hopefully this time, second time might be lucky, and he could drill his own way into the smelt hole while all the rest of the dwarven troops were away, steal the metal from the lightly guarded room, and then come back down to Bonestash, finish the Doomsphere, set it off, Bob's your uncle, all the dwarves are dead. So that's his plan. So he sends Fanquil, he's like, Fanquil, buddy, thank you for doing this. Go get that metal. We'll have a Doom Sphere and then we can rule the Skaven Empire. Don't you worry, buddy. So Fanquil gets this army together. He rouses the troops with preaching of the Horned Rat. He's like, we can do this for the Horned Rat, everyone. Let's go. And he marches on the sixth deep of Karakangul and proceeds to lay siege the dwarven stronghold for Ikit Claw. Ikit Claw, not wanting to maybe risk that Fanquil comes back alive this time, had actually sent some troops with Fanquil, but all of the troops that he'd sent, he'd kind of stolen from Steel Grin earlier. They weren't his best and brightest, but he ordered them to turn to and run cause a massive rout but while they were running away try and kill Fanquil and then you guys will come back rejoin the main forces and we'll go through this uh, other tunnel you don't need to waste your lives just make sure that Grey Seer is dead so once he sent them away he got his actual army together got the drill pieces he'd have a number of warp grinders who can carve through dirt and mud with their kind of with the warp energy that comes off the bottom of their weapons they were going to lead the first wave with hundreds of skaven slaves into the smelting hole hopefully that might be enough but there's also a secondary force following up um, to dig a bigger tunnel with a massive drill piece that was held by two huge rat ogres augmented by clan scryer uh, who were going to hold this massive drill piece with a skaven even on top uh, and go through the mud that way with most of their poison wind globadiers, their mortars, their warp lock jazales, Ikit Claw himself and his automaton troops. So they uh, sort of set off for the smelt hall and all seemed to be going swimmingly. The first wave went in, there was a small group of dwarves in there, uh, they seemed to be making progress. The slaves were dying, but that's what slaves do. They could come in with the main force, wipe away the little resistance and steal the last of the metal alloy they needed for the doom sphere. So Ikit Claw and his party of elite troops burst out of the center of the floor of the smelting hall to make contact with the dwarves who had formed some kind of defensive perimeter around their sector of the hall itself, huddling around the large pieces of metal that had been withdrawn from the Karak. And lo and behold, once Ikit emerged from the hall, surrounded by his automaton elite guard, did he lock eyes with none other than the blonde bearded dwarf. And he made eye contact with his ancient enemy, only to see the dwarf fire off a flare into the roof of the massive chamber that went off to his loud and sudden cry of now. At that very moment, dozens if not hundreds of dwarves appeared over the gangways above the smelting hall, armed with their rifles with crossbows, and they started firing down upon the Skaven hordes. Not to be outdone, Ikit was confident in his numbers and the troops he'd brought with him, and ordered his warp lock Giselle 
fails to start firing back up into the rafters of the Karak chamber. Dark blankets began to be flung over the top of the huge smelting pots that were located around the chamber. This had obviously been a ruse. The smelting pots were not only sitting there empty, unactive, they were filled with armored dwarves. As dwarves with thick clad armor jumped out of all of these smelting pots, wielding their massive axes, and they started to hack away at the Skaven slave. The smell of Skaven fear musk filled the air as he could see his troops begin to waver under this surprise attack. Ikit knew he had to act and act now just to sure up the morale of his troops who were about to break. Almost instinctually, he pointed towards the walkways high above him and unleashed a torrent of warp lightning. It rippled through row upon row of dwarven thunderer and crossbowmen as their skin started to melt and they fell from the gangplanks high above, squishing into piles of ooze as they hit the floor below. This seemed to do the trick and his skaven warriors rallied with every missile firing up into the walkways trying to bring down any kind of dwarven missile troops they could. With the weapons team starting to take aim at the armored dwarves coming out of the smelting pot, of particular effect with the poisoned wind mortars firing their noxious missiles into gangs of dwarves, bring them all down, choking and grasping at their throats and faces. These were doing vast amounts of damage to the numbers of the dwarves, and they were not numbers that the dwarves could afford to spare. Suddenly, out of his peripheral vision, a mad naked dwarfing charged straight at Ikit Claw. He was successfully intercepted and set upon by not only Ikit's automatons, but some of the surrounding clan rats as well. He didn't know what this naked dwarfing was, but he was glad it had been taken care of as he began to order his troops further into the chamber, trying to get at that metal that this little party of dwarves were still holding their ground around to make use of for his doom sphere. But just as he began to move forward, one of the automatons off to his right hand side's head flew off as he again locked eyes with his arch nemesis, the blonde dwarf, who'd obviously taken a deadly accurate shot from a fair distance. The pistol then turned towards Ikit and began to fire. The first shot pinged harmlessly off Ikit's armor, but this was enough. He had lost his patience as he pointed his mechanical halberd, storm demon straight at the party of dwarves and unleashed a furious dark lightning at the entire party. A shout of scatter was heard just before the lightning bolt made contact straight onto the blonde dwarf who then collapsed. Finally, this had been dealt with as he continued his march forward, surrounded by his most elite troops. Ikit, not to be one to shy away from combat, came into contact with a few dwarves himself, using all the weapons at his disposal to get rid of them. As he neared the metal, he eventually came across two dwarves, cowering around each other, obviously trying to take shelter. They hadn't noticed him yet, and he opened up his gauntlet and set the first one ablaze blaze with a plume of warp fire, watching the dwarf's face melt into his beard. Then he turned his attention to the other one, again a gauntlet still opened and unleashed. However, the flames were stopped short, and lo and behold, what had appeared before Ikit was none other than a runesmith, one of the so-called magic wielders of the dwarves. This would not do, but the runesmith was not one to be set aside lightly, and as Ikit's sadistic grin began to fade, the runesmith charged at him with his rune hammer aflame with some kind of dwarven magics. Ikit ducked the hammer and clawed at the runesmith, only grazing off the runesmith's gromril armor. And then he brought around Storm Demon, and the two blazing weapons clashed between them. The sheer magical feedback of the rune and Ikit's own magical weapon. The weapons clashed, sending energy coursing through both combatants, causing them both to convulse violently. Then, Ikit's halberd began to squeal as warp steam began to vent from its mechanical parts. No 
knowing that this would mean an impending explosion, Ikit threw his halberd into the crowd of oncoming Skaven. As the rune master connected with his torso with an almighty swing of his hammer, Ikit, forced back through the violence of the blow, let out an, an involuntary squeal as he was sent hurtling backwards. With the rage of a cornered rat now knowing that this was his last opportunity, he flung himself with blinding speed at the runesmith, parrying an oncoming fist while managing to pull one of Ikit's own pistols and shoot the runesmith straight through the belly, exploded into a plume of blood on the other side. Grinning again sadistically, knowing that he had won this fight. The runesmith, not giving up yet, raised his hammer again to bring down upon the head of Ikit Claw. Ikit used his gauntleted hand to catch the hand of the runesmith, wielding the hammer, holding it in place, almost feeling the strength fade away from the runesmith, and again, with that sadistic grin, he closed the talons of his enormous claw around the hand of the runesmith, severing it and leaving naught but a bloody stump spurting with each of the dwarf's last heartbeats. Ikit rose to his feet as he slowly wrapped the talons of his gauntleted hand round the dwarf's head, simply whispering into the dwarf rune master's ear, die, die, full flesh, as he intentionally, slowly closed the talons as he could hear the dwarf scream and blood and brain pulp squeeze through the talons as he brought them ever so slowly to a close around the rune master's head. The deed done, Ikit opened his talons again to lick the viscera and brain matter from his claws. As he turned, his troops had managed to get a hold of the metal he needed. It was time to sound the retreat. Ikit, still bearing the wound of that massive blow he took from the rune master's hammer, had a slight limp to him as he was returning back to the hole they dug in the middle of the room. Some of his surrounding warlock engineers eyed him ambitiously, at which case Ikit knew the way of the Skaven too well. One of them would take his injury as a weakness and attempt to usurp him. Ikit knew better than this and whispered some ancient hex he'd learned from a faraway land as the closest warlock engineer, the one with the most seething ambition in his eyes, collapsed on the floor as his heart exploded from his chest, having succumbed to the ancient magics of Ikit Claw. His place firmly established as leader of the party, he then again repeated the order, at which point everyone followed suit and retreated into the tunnel. Ikit didn't need all the Skaven to survive, so really once his elite troops were through, he collapsed the tunnels behind them, killing many stragglers who were left, still trying to make their way back to Bonestash beneath the Dwarven Karak. Once he eventually got back to his workshop where he was keeping the Doom Sphere, he was livid to find that Fankwall, this feckless Gracia, had managed to survive and was sitting atop his doom sphere. Fankwall then somehow had the gall to assume control of the doom sphere, telling Ikit Claw that he had to obey him. Ikit and the rest of his troops, simply chuckling at this notion, began to make a move on Fankwall, at which point he commanded his massive rat ogre to attack clan scryer troops yet again. Most of them did not even bother to retreat, but then when one of its enormous fists came crashing down upon one of the clan scryer troops, Ikit knew that somehow, whether it was the damage that this bone rip had sustained, which was substantial, or something else had gone on that had unlocked the bone ripper from harming troops of clan scryer. So with this 
and the fact that Thanquo claimed to have found an ancient artifact of the Skaven known as the Hand of Vitek, knowing the kind of power a potential artifact like this could bring, Ikit Claw saw no choice but to obey Thanquo for now until an opportunity presented itself to get rid of this meddling fool. Now, Ikit managing to convince Thanquo, who knew nothing of the machinery of the Doom Sphere, that his machine was not yet complete. Obviously, they'd gone to get the metals for it, so he bought himself some time to build up the Doom Sphere without much interference. Thanquo might think he's the head of the party, but uh, as long as the Doom Sphere is still getting built, Built, and Ikit has a chance to set it off. That's all he really needs. So as the hours wear on, work on the Doom Sphere continues. Fankwall made himself very much at home, stealing a throne from the ancient master of Bonestash, who'd long since run off, and setting him up in the chamber of the Doom Sphere. Now the Doom Sphere was very much nearing completion. Ikit was at this stage just buying himself some time. For all that mattered, it was complete. Then he noticed out the corner of his eye, approaching Fankwall on the other side of the massive chamber, was one of his warlock engineers, whispering in the Grey Seer's ear. Then the massive rat ogre moved as though a massive statue coming to life and crushed the skull of the warlock engineer as Fankwall and the rat ogre began to march with aggressive intent straight in Ikit's direction. He had no idea what this could be about. He could only guess that this traitorous warlock Warlock engineer had given up the game and told them that the Doom Sphere was basically ready. He didn't have much time to think, and as Fanquil drew close, Ikit tried to reason with him. Stay, stay your paw! To which Fanquil simply said, Weapon is finished, and so are you. It still needs warp stone as Ikit tried to like play his last hand. It's not finished, you have to stop. Bone Ripper was obviously circling around the side of Ikit's vision, knowing that he was about to attack. Vanquil seemed to pause for a moment in hesitation, but without pausing, the Bone Ripper unleashed from one of his weapon hand a stream of flame that was coming straight towards Ikit. He had little time to think, and he had to dodge. As the smoke filled their part of the chamber, he couldn't see Vanquil, but could hear him whispering in the dark, Peace, friend! Peace, peace! Knowing that Vanquil had probably believed his story in the end, but that the Bone Ripper had moved. It mattered not. The smoke gave him enough cover to make his move against the Gracier, who was wandering around in it. Then he'd only have to deal with the Bone Ripper. Ikit emerged from the plume, knowing that the massive creature couldn't see him from his vantage point within the smoke. Ikit marched towards Vanquil. Vanquil had obviously made contact, and Ikit just said, Now, Fanquil must die burn. Fanquil pathetically knelt, pleading for his life. I let allow you to share sphere, he said to Ikit. Ikit was not having any of it and unleashed a bolt of warp lightning straight at the Gracier. Fanquil managed to narrowly avoid this bolt, but at that point, all of Ikit's men were still loyal to him, drew weapons from hiding places, and started to fire towards Fanquil. Fanquil kind of disappeared, scurried away, and started to run hiding behind cover. Then, from the other side of the room where the chamber's main entrance was, the cry of dwarves, dwarves came up as the whole room turned to face the oncoming threat of an invading party of dwarves. The party was being led by none other than the blonde bearded dwarf and they started to march into the chamber as all guns started to turn towards them that had previously been hunting down Fanquil. Out of the darkness, a voice from high above the walkway where Fanquil must have scarpered to began to shout out, Surrender, submit! Fight and all dwarf meat will die-die! This was Fanquil. Ikit was almost dumbstruck with the sheer audacity of this Skaven to again try and take control of the situation and place himself in a leadership role in this face-off. As Fanquo continued, I'll start start Doomsphere. And then the dwarf seemed to have some vague flicker of recognition as to what the Doomsphere was as he hesitated. And he shouted back up, recognizing he wasn't speaking to Ikit and speaking to Fanquo, speaking some gibberish that Ikit couldn't make sense of, saying, I have been warned, you will be my doom. 
as the two continued to address each other. Ikit had had enough of this, drew a pistol, and fired in the direction of Fankel. He didn't have a clear shot, but this had just so enraged him that he didn't care. That shot set off all shots. Shots going at the dwarves, dwarves firing the Skaven, some Skaven still firing at Fanquil, just the whole room erupted into gunfire. Ikit Claw had never lost focus from Fanquil as he scurried across the room. His pistol had run out of ammunition, but that didn't stop Claw's rage as he just threw the pistol at Fanquil's head. He grabbed his weapon, which had been recovered from the dwarf smelting room, and hadn't exploded but just needed to vent for a while, Storm Demon, and aimed it squarely at Fanquil. Just at that moment, shots began to ping off his armor as he started taking shots into his actual flesh. This was someone sniping him, and it was none other than his old enemy, the cursed blood dwarf, who was sniping him from an almost unbelievable distance away, hitting him multiple times, bringing Fanquil crashing down to his knees. Now seemingly helpless, stopped in mid-track, thinking that this bloody blonde dwarf had got the better of him. As the seemingly last fatal shot rang out, he heard a thump a few meters in front of him, followed by several others. There had been some kind of magical barrier erected between him and the firing dwarf. He surmised this must be the Grey Seer, still believing I had to complete the Doom Sphere and thus throwing down some ill-calculated protection for me. So the shots rang out and the blonde dwarf, knowing that his shots were no longer of use, began to get on the move, heading straight towards Ikit. Ikit tried to kind of claw his way back towards the Doom Sphere, but he knew he probably wouldn't get there in time, hoping that the silly Gracie's magic would protect him long enough to get there. As he clawed his way across the floor of the room, he could feel a shift in the air around him, knowing then, seemingly, that the magical barrier had been brought down for some reason. And in front of him appeared none other than his old enemy, the Blonde Dwarf. Ikit, at this point coated in his own blood, looked up at the Dwarf. You try try stop me, you can't stop progress. As he tapped on the side of the Doom Sphere which he'd managed to reach, the Dwarf spoke to him. This madness ends now, and he charged straight at Ikit Claw. Ikit, using the last of his strength, managed to sidestep the Dwarf's downward blow, as again he tried to use his claws to scrape out the ribs of the oncoming Dwarf, only to hit his specialized armor. The Dwarf turned, knocking Ikit down to the ground and kicking him straight in the snout. Ikit went back, reeling from the pain, knowing that he didn't have the strength for a long draw out fight he raised his gauntlet to try and let some flame take care of this terrible annoyance as he let rip warp fire from his hand the dwarf rolled and dodged seemingly falling over the edge of the platform only for the flames to subside and the dwarf to with his upper body strength fling himself back onto the platform having been holding on to the edge now he faced down, coming straight at Ikit Claw. Ikit again rose his gauntlet, only to be hit with some kind of egg that released white powder all over his flame hand. Knowing what this was, some kind of flame retardant material, it put out his flames, and he knew he could no longer use that weapon effectively. With his talons, he slashed at the dwarf's head. The dwarf ducked underneath his claws as each talon scraped across the surface of the Doom Sphere itself. The the dwarf being low, pounced up into the chest of Ikit, tackling him down onto the ground, holding him in place. The dwarf had got the better of the fading Ikit's strength. Ikit, with one weapon left to him, his metal face mask, smashed it into the nose of the blonde dwarf as blood gushed out of his nostrils. Using this second's reprieve, he squirmed free of the dwarf's grasp, charging with the last of his strength towards the Doomsphere, looking down on his enemy still on the ground, now all dwarf things die. As he started to move the final levers into place with his hand on the final one, he suddenly felt a jolting shock from behind him, one that singed what little hairs he had remaining on his already burned and scarred body. He turned around to see Fanquil there, trying to stop him setting off the Doomsphere. 
foolish Gracia, this damn fool Gracia getting in his way, the Doomsphere would take care of him. As he plunged down the final lever, he shouted out to Fanquil, Die, die, full meat! As he skitter leaped himself away, teleporting away from the danger area in a puff of purple smoke. Ikit had completed his mission and had set the Doomsphere into motion. Now, once Ikit got safely away, he couldn't help but notice the World's Edge Mountains not disintegrating into rubble, so he knew somehow, but not understanding how, his scheme had been thwarted. Now, on a side note here for you guys listening to the story, what happened in the rest of that chamber was that Fanquil, who only wanted to use the Doomsphere as a bargaining chip to become Emperor of all the Skaven Empire and to scare off all the enemies of Skaven, uh, never wanted to set it off. So he proceeded to the machinery, and having once bumped into a warlock of Clan Scryer who told him once that, you know, always cut the red wire, he opened the internal machinery of the Doomsphere to find that Ikit, knowing that somebody might notice, had made all the wires inside black. Black. But it almost didn't matter. As the Doomsphere began to sputter and go into motion, the dwarves withdrew, seemingly confident somehow that something had gone on. And indeed, what this blonde dwarf, otherwise known to us who maybe know dwarf names as Clarak, had done was that he had used his runesmith friend who died in that fight with Ikit Claw to put basically a booby trap on the metal. And then when the metal got to a certain point of functionality, the booby trap caused the whole machine to almost black hole into itself just crumple in on its own energy and disappear basically so the dwarf had tampered with the machine he'd only gone down there to make sure that Fanquil was using the metal they'd booby trapped and hadn't just used other metal he'd found elsewhere so that's why the dwarves were down there and why unfortunately Ikit Claw's plan to rid themselves of the dwarves once and for all didn't quite work now, this story kind of continues, actually, if you guys want to hear the rest of what happens to Fanquil and Clarak the Blonde Dwarf in their ongoing struggles for the same Karak in Queek's story. So, check out my Queek video popping up in the top right-hand corner now, and you'll kind of get a sense of how that story actually ends. But from Ikit's perspective, he teleported out of there and maybe never knew exactly what went wrong with the machine, and maybe went back to the drawing board to try and decide it again. But as far as his everyday activities, he's still working for the betterment of the Skaven Empire, still working to consolidate his, his own power, still working on science and machinery to improve the armaments and arms of his beloved clan Scryer to allow them to climb to the top of Skavendom as they tried all those centuries ago. So he's venturing the world as far as wide as he can, trying to pick up any magic he can to further his aims. Now, as far as his rules on the tabletop are concerned, he counted as what's known as the level 3 wizard. Uh, he did the uh, rune of the magic lore of the Skaven lore of Ruin. Um, he had warp lightning as something he could substitute if he got a random spell. Um, he also had the Iron Frame, which gave him a number of abilities. This Iron Frame he gave himself since his horrific accident. And what that did was gave him a uh, plus three armor save. So any roll of a dice, any three or above, would give him a save against damage, provided armor counted against it. And it gave him a ward save as well. So very protecting. But it also boosts his strength from what would be, normally, without his Iron Frame, a two to a five. So a significant improvement on his strength there as far as his iron frame gives him and on the tabletop at least in 8th edition what his gauntlet with the warp fire throw in it would allow him to do was that once per game i think it was he was allowed to set off an area of effect flame spell um or more of a flame spell going off that would do a lot of damage potentially but that was Ikit Claw on the tabletop. He also, of course, had his halberd, uh, Storm Demon, which we spoke about a couple of times in the story. And what that did was it went through any armor. If he had armor, it didn't count against this weapon, and it would also allow him to use the bound spell Dark Lightning. 
So it would give him those two attributes, his uh, Storm Demon there. But that is, uh, for better or worse, guys, Ikit Claw, the tinkerer, the mastermind behind behind some of the most devious Scave's inventions. I'm pretty sure we will see him one day in Total War Warhammer. I don't think it will be with this upcoming May update, but maybe uh, with one later than that. We'll have to wait and see. But I'm pretty sure we'll see Ikit Claw eventually. But that's about it for me, guys. If you enjoyed this video, do check out my uh, Legendary Lords playlist. If you want more stories like this one from Ikit Claw. Um, other than that, guys as always a huge thank you all for watching and i hope to catch you all on the next one all right guys bye